Welcome back to the Air Canada Centre where the Leafs will honour a quartet of greats as they welcome them to Legends Row. Outside Air Canada Centre stand the statues of 10 great men who built and defined what it is to be a Toronto Maple Leaf. Their legacies are preserved for all time. Tonight on Hockey Day in Canada, we will continue to build on that profound legacy honouring four more Maple Leaf greats. Please direct your attention to the video board as we reveal our next inductees onto Legends Row. Born in Toronto in 1909, Charlie Conacher was one of 10 children who described his upbringing in the following way. We didn't have a pretzel. We didn't have enough money to buy toothpaste. We were poor as church mice. The Toronto Star elaborated. There were card games in the park, pickup sides, battles with gangs from other parks, all of it valuable in learning the art of survival. That was Conacher, leader and champion of the poor sweats, who knew what it was to be hungry and without a dime. An accomplished athlete in many sports, Charlie would settle on hockey and the Toronto Marlboros. Ultimately, he was summoned by the Maple Leafs and was tasked with patrolling the right wing on the famous kid line. Had the Art Ross or Rocket Richard trophies existed in the 1930s, Charlie Conacher would have been a seven-time recipient. There was no greater scoring threat in hockey than Charlie. His play inspired the Toronto Star to write, Conacher is an example of what hard work, the desire to accomplish things, and the will to win will do for one. He was a champion of champions, the Babe Ruth of the ice lanes. Teammate King Clancy said of Charlie, I never had a finer friend in Toronto. He was my protection as a Maple Leaf. He didn't go looking for trouble, but if it came along, he would clear it up. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome, representing his father, Brad Conacher. In 1960, the Red Wings traded their captain and Simcoe, Ontario native Red Kelly to the New York Rangers. When notified of the trade by Wings GM Jack Adams, Kelly simply said, I'll think about it. Red figured 13 seasons and four Stanley Cups were enough. So he retired, reporting to work the next day to his new job, working in a tool factory. After hearing the news, King Clancy figured that Red just might accept a trade to Toronto. So he called him up to see if he was interested. Red agreed to secretly meet with King for dinner at a Toronto restaurant, flying in under an assumed name and wearing a disguise so that nobody would know he was in town. Their efforts to keep the meeting a secret were ruined when none other than Rocket Richard was coincidentally seated at the table next to Red. After one look, the Rocket leaned over and whispered, Hello, Rouge. What are you doing here? After talking with King and Punch in Black, Red agreed to come to Toronto, and a deal was worked out. Red was coming home. One of the reasons Punch wanted Red so badly was that Imlock knew the Leafs had to go through Montreal each season to win the Cup, and he wanted a centerman that could match up against the Canadian Jean Beliveau. So, incredibly, after 13 seasons as a defenseman that included a Norris Trophy, Red accepted the challenge and moved to center ice. The move paid off as Red went on to win four more Stanley Cups with Toronto in 62, 63, 64, and 67. It wasn't all just checking for the former Norris Trophy winner turned center iceman as he led the Leafs in playoff scoring through their 60s dynasty. Remarkably, Red did all this while also serving in the House of Commons. Red's linemate, Frank Mahovlitz, said of his friend, I've played with so many of the greats, but Red Kelly, to me, was the greatest centerman that I ever played with. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome, representing her father, Casey Kelly.
Born in Timmins, Ontario, Frank Mahovlich was signed by the Maple Leafs at the age of 16 and assigned to St. Mike's, where he earned his nickname, the Big M. He was called up to the Leafs in 1957 to take Ted Kennedy's spot in the lineup the day after Teeter retired. Expectations of Frank were running so high, some took to calling him Moses. At the end of his first full season, he was named the NHL's Rookie of the Year, beating out Bobby Hull. By February of 1961, Frank had become unstoppable, scoring 48 goals in the first 56 games of the season, setting a new standard for goal scoring and establishing a new club record for goals in a single season, a mark that would stand for 21 years. One year later, he would help the Leafs capture Stanley Cup glory for the first time in 11 seasons. By the end of his Leafs career, Frank Mahovlich had scored more goals than anyone in a Toronto uniform in his final seven full seasons with the club. The only NHL player that had scored more goals over that stretch was Hull. Frank won a total of four Stanley Cups with Toronto in his Hall of Fame career, and he was named an NHL first or second team All-Star on six occasions, a Leafs record which still stands. Past Leafs president Ken Dryden said of Frank, if you close your eyes and think about Frank Mahovlich, there is an image, it's there. That image for me, and I think for a lot of people, is Frank Mahovlich in full flight. That was a sight. Leafs Nation, number 27, Frank Mahovlich. Born in Kelvington, Saskatchewan. The Maple Leafs made defenseman Wendell Clark the first overall pick in the 1985 NHL entry draft. That season, Wendell set a Leafs record for goals by a rookie with 34 and was runner-up for the Calder Trophy, all while serving 227 minutes in the box. As a gift from Leafs management, each player was given a trip for two to go anywhere in the world they wanted to fly. Most players chose exotic locations. Wendell flew home to Saskatchewan. When asked why, Wendell simply explained that it was planting season on his parents' farm and that he needed to lend a hand. Combined with his on-ice ferociousness, it was that kind of down-to-earth nature off the ice that made Leaf fans fall in love with a kid from Kelvington. In his seventh season, Clark was named captain, and the following year, he would lead the Leafs on a memorable playoff run. Wendell averaged nearly a point a game in the spring of 1993, but might be best remembered for teaching Marty McSorley a valuable lesson in game one of the conference final. And this is going to draw Clark and McSorley into a rock and roll. Clark is nailing McSorley. Nails him with another uppercut. The following season, the Clark led Leafs would reach the conference final again, courtesy of Wendell's two goal night in game seven against the Sharks. He still holds the record for the most multiple goal game sevens in NHL history. Leafs president Ken Dryden described Wendell upon his retirement. Game in, game out, year in, year out, just a kid cruising the ice looking to cause trouble. A wicked wrist shot for a goal, a crushing body check, a fight, opponents' bodies littered on the ice, fans out of their seats and the place in an uproar. In sports, it's said that the fans are with you, win or tie. Leaf fans have been with Wendell, win or tie or loss, because he has been with them win or tie or loss. Our final inductee tonight, number 17, Wendell Clark. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, your newest members of Legends Row.